Good morning. What a wonderful opportunity it is to come to worship this day, the Sunday before Christmas. This is a service of song and of word, and we invite you to simply relax and sit down and enjoy the atmosphere, the sacred space, enjoy the music and the sounds of God that surround us all as we come together in communion with each other. A couple of announcements to share. First, a correction on the list that lists the poinsettias, where it says Bill, Kathy, and Cole Miller. They, are, they gave a poinsettia in memory of a Carl Faust and Julie Faust, that's F-O-U-S-T. Today also is our, our annual Christmas party and a great, great meal to go along with that. If uh, you did not know about that for some reason, if you're visiting us this morning, we welcome you not just to worship, but we welcome you to our party afterwards. We'd love to have you stay. I'm sure the food will multiply and there will be enough for all, and we sing some carols and have a good time. I truly hope that everybody here will join us for the party following worship. There are other announcements in the bulletin. You can read those on your own. I will just simply highlight Christmas Eve is next Saturday. There's a 7 o'clock uh, worship service and then also an 11 o'clock candlelight service. You're welcome to one or both of those. And then we will have church at 11 o'clock on Christmas Day, an opportunity to worship on the day of Jesus' birth. Now let us continue with our worship as the choir brings us together with our choral introit. As we consider ourselves as people of love, we look to the scriptures. Hear these words from 1 John. My dear friends, let us love one another because the source of love is God. Everyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but the unloving know nothing of God, for God is love. This is how he showed his love among us. He sent his only son into the world that we might have life through him. This is what love really is. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to atone for our sins. If God thus loved us, my dear friends, we also must love one another. God has never been seen by anyone, but if we love one another, he himself dwells in us. His love is brought to perfection within us. Amen. Our anthem this morning is entitled, Keep Silence. It is a gift from Jim Archman many, many years ago in memory of Myrtle Lehman.
Please join in the prayer of illumination. Dear most holy God, let our hearts and minds be open to receive your gift of love. Let us abide in your love as you abide in us. Let us be transformed by your holy presence, and may we be bearers of the life of your grace. Please join me in the call to worship. Love is patient and kind, without it I am nothing. Love is not a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Love envies no one, is never boastful, conceited, or rude. Love leads no sore of all and delights in the truth. There is nothing love cannot face. There is no limit to its trust, its hope, its endurance. Love will never end. May the light of love shine Christ-like within us all. Amen. Susan Miller and her two grandsons will be writing the candle of love this morning.
join with me in the lighting the Advent candle of love. On the first Sunday in Advent, we lift the candle of hope. Jesus was and is the hope of the world. On the second Sunday in Advent, we lift the candle of peace. Jesus was and is the peace we seek. Today, we light the candle of love. We light the candle of love, knowing that this is God's gift of love and care. In this gift, we begin to know the true nature of God. And in that blessing, we more fully love one another. Dear loving God, help us to prepare our hearts and souls for Jesus' coming by loving one another. You love us. Amen. Don't you love surprises? <laughs> I tell you, if there's anything Christmas taught the early people 2,000 years ago, it was to be open to surprises. And that tradition continues today. I'd like to invite the children to come forward now for a time of sharing who are always full of surprises. It's great to see you this morning. After we have our little gathering here and talk for a few minutes, we're going to sing a, a song called The Friendly Beast that the dulcimers are going to lead for us. And I thought we would just sit here and enjoy that, and then you can go off, and I'll tell you when about the second verse, you can go off to Sunday school. But I wanted to show you a really special nativity that was painted and given to me a couple years ago. And this is... Uh, got some animals with it, and that's one reason why I wanted to show it to you. We've got some sheep right here, and we have, like, uh, oh, here's another, um, let's see, is there a sheep there? There's a cat. So we have, we don't have lots of donkeys and things or, or cows, but we do have some friendly beasts, and we have a horse, and this is all part of, of, of the nativity that is up here. And when Jesus was born in a stable, not in a house, not in a hospital, our thoughts are there must have been animals present. And the Bible doesn't tell us animals were present, but we're thinking stables, so we're thinking animals. And so we have this marvelous song called The Friendly Beasts. And I wanted to show you this beautiful crush set of, of friendly beasts beasts as well. So let's let's all sing together now the friendly beasts as led by our friends the dulcimers this morning. Uh, 
have your hands? Right leg. That's good, right with the tune. Good, wait. Okay, why don't you stand and go to the Sunday School now? In the stable dark, but glad to tell of the gift he gave Emmanuel, the gift he gave Emmanuel. All right. We come together in prayer this morning and this season knowing that there are hearts that are filled with joy and wonder and celebrate life and celebrate the good things that surround you. And at the same time, there are hearts that are sad, people that have had losses, have memories, people that are facing difficult times. We come together at this time also as a, as a nation who is starting to look at um, a political arena and struggling to make decisions for, for our nation and our economy, both locally and in the world. And we come together at this time as a nation where our soldiers are pulling out of Iraq and there's rejoicing about that after uh, many years of struggle and tribulation in that country. And so we continue to pray for Iraq and what their people now face and how it will go for them. And so we come as a people who are somewhat isolated and insular in our town here in Norris, Tennessee, and this country we live in. But yet we do remember those that are struggling and we do think of our entire world at Christmas. So let's have our prayer together. Dear God, this is sacred space. This sanctuary, this tabernacle of your presence. We confess, God, that we have not always done the right thing in life. We have not always said the right things, had the right actions. We've not always created harmony and peace in our midst as we struggle to live. And we ask for, for forgiveness as we continue to move forward, sometimes just placing one foot in front of another and struggling to find the right pathway ahead of us. We ask for peace and communion among those with us on this journey. We ask for, for help as we walk this life. Oh God, there's not many of us that can do it alone. We need help of family and of friends and of church and community and of government and of Mother Earth. 
Help us, O Lord, to be gracious, for this is a season of hope, a season of new vision, a season of transforming power that is part of our very midst, a season and a time of recognizing the miraculous, the wondrous, and the mysterious among us. A time of opening up our minds and hearts to those things which are not always rational and logical, but are God-given, are things that birth us into a new place in life, stir our souls and imaginations. And so we have come to this place drawn by some sort of power that is beyond our real understanding because not all choose to come. And so we are grateful for that power. We are grateful for the opportunity to be here, to learn, to love, to be part of your communion, O Lord. And so let us now pause as we, each of us, reflect for a moment what it means to be stirred to the depths of our soul by your touch and to live a life in your presence. Hear our prayers, O oh God. And at a very present moment when the disciples came to Jesus and they asked him for a prayer, it was a specific time in history. It was a moment when they were together. It was not an illusion. It is not a dream. It is a time and an event in the history of the faith when they asked for this prayer. And Jesus said to them, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs>
You'll notice that there's not a gospel selection printed above sermon. It simply says the Christmas story. And I would like to share uh, that story with you this morning without any real commentary. I would simply like to tell you the story as it's recorded for the most part in the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Matthew. But before I begin, I'm going to give you a moment with the people seated around you to have a moment of interaction. Yikes, what's that mean? And that simply means this. I want you to just refresh in your minds the elements of the Christmas story as you can remember it, as it comes to you. What are the characters and events of the story? Who are the people? What takes place? So we're literally going to have just a murmur of sound across the sanctuary as you warm yourself up to this story. Talk to each other around you and just kind of blurt out the things you remember, okay? Can you, can you do that? It's, it's an interactive moment. So I'm going to give you just a few minutes to, to do that. Are you ready? Begin. <laughs> Okay, that's good. That's good. You got it all, I know. You told you told the story. I said that was good. Never get it back. Maybe my mic's not on. If you put Santa and the elves in there, you've got the wrong story. but it is part of our culture. The story from the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Matthew, woven together just a bit, go something like this. And imagine, if you will, that it's a long time ago, and you've not heard too much about this story. In fact, you're probably not able to read about 90% of you. So you rely upon oral transmission to receive these stories. And in fact, up until the 16th, 17th century, 18th century, the only ones that were telling this story were actually the monks. They, they kept the telling alive. Not many people really knew it, really talked about it, really cared about it. It wasn't part of the general understanding. It wasn't on every street corner. It wasn't in every church. So the story goes something like this. You see, it was about the sixth month of Elizabeth's birth that the angel Gabriel came to Mary. Mary was a young maiden. She, she lived in a small town called Nazareth. And this angel Gabriel appeared to her and really took her by surprise. And she was pretty frightened. But the angel said, don't be afraid, Mary, for behold, you have found favor with God. And Mary was like concerned, and she didn't know what this meant, and so she started to ponder this, and the angel said, really, really, don't be afraid, for you have found favor with God, for guess what? In your womb, a child is going to be given, and you're going to have a son, and you will name him Jesus. And Mary is a bit confused about this, because she was just a young maiden, and even though she was engaged to a man named Joseph in her community, she hadn't yet been with him as husband and wife. And so she said to the angel, you know, how can this be? I'm just a young maiden. I've, I've not even lived with Joseph yet. And the angel said, well, it'll work like this. The Most High will come upon you and will overshadow you, 
and the child to be born in you will be called Jesus. And he will be of this house and lineage of David, his ancestor, and he will be given the whole kingdom of Jacob, and he will reign over the kingdom of Jacob forever and forever. And the angel paused, and Mary was pretty overcome by this news, as you can well imagine. And the angel said, and you know, there's even more to this story. Remember Elizabeth. You know Elizabeth, your cousin, lives out in the hills of, of Judea. Even in her old age, she is now pregnant, and this is actually the sixth month of her pregnancy, because you know, Mary, nothing is impossible with God. And the angel stopped talking, and Mary probably thought about this a minute, and then she said, let it be unto me as you have said it. I am the Lord's servant. And so then the angel left. So Mary, on about the third month of her pregnancy, got up and she went to visit Elizabeth in the Judean hillside. And as she walked in the door of Elizabeth's house, Elizabeth's baby inside of her, a six-month-old baby, jumped for joy. And Elizabeth felt this movement. And she said, oh my gosh. Mary, the, the baby inside of me is leaping for joy because I can perceive that you are the mother of this wonderful child that God has given us. And I am filled with joy, Elizabeth said, at, at you being here to visit me. What a blessing this is for me that you are here. And Mary sang a beautiful song about being the Lord's servant and the wondrous things that God has done in the earth. Meanwhile, back in his workshop where Joseph lived and, and made his living, word came to him that his betrothed Mary was with child. It's a shameful thing. And by law, he could legally have her taken out and stoned. But Joseph was a righteous man, he was a good man, and he was concerned, he was filled with compassion and love, and so he decided that he would divorce her quietly and therefore not do harm to her. And that night he, he fell asleep, troubled and sore and feeling the pain of this event. And while he slept, an angel of the Lord came to him and said, Joseph, 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 don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child that is in her is conceived of the Holy Spirit, and a son will be born, and you shall name him Jesus, because he will take away the sins of the world. Oh, this was wonderful news for Joseph, and, and this happened, you see, so that the prophet's saying from the Old Testament would come true, that a child would be born, his name will be Emmanuel. God, God is present with us. Well, Mary and Joseph went to the next level of their life. And Part of that level of that life was that they were living together, but they had no relations with each other yet. But the strange thing happened in this world of Judea and Israel. You see, it was the time when Caesar Augustus was the emperor of the Roman Empire, the time when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And the emperor put a, a taxation, a, an enrollment, a registration upon the people and each person had to go to the town that is of their ancestry. So Joseph, who lived up in Nazareth in, in Israel, had to go down to Judea, to the town of Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of, of David. So he took with him Mary, his betrothed, 
and she by this time was large with child. And they got there, and the time came for her to give birth to this child there in Bethlehem, the, the home of King David. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and she laid him in a manger, in a manger, in a stable, because there was no room for them in the inn because of all the people being there for this enrollment of the emperor of the Roman Empire. Now out, out in that region, the hill region outside Bethlehem, there were a lot of shepherds and the shepherds kept watch over their flocks by night. They never left their sheep. They took care of them. And suddenly, out of nowhere, an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with fear. And the angel said, don't be afraid for unto you is born this day, this very day, in the city of David, a, a savior who is the Christ, the Lord. And you know what? This will be a sign for you. You'll find him wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And then suddenly there was with that angel a, a whole multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those with whom God favors. And then they all disappear. Whoa, the, the shepherds were <laughs> amazed and they said to one another, hey, let's, let's go down to Bethlehem and see this thing that the Lord has made known to us. And then they went with haste. And they came down to Bethlehem and they found the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And they told everyone there what the angels had made known to them. And all the people that were there at this birth, they, they were amazed. And they marveled at what the shepherds had told them. But Mary, Mary pondered these things. In her heart, she, she wondered about this child and what God had in store for him and for her and for Joseph. And then the shepherds left and they returned to their flocks in the field, glorifying and praising God for all that had been told them. There were wise men. Some of you might know them as magi or astrologers even. These men that studied the scriptures and looked to the heavens for signs. And they, they saw a star and they thought that this was the star about the birth of the Messiah. And so they came from the east and they came to Jerusalem, the holy city. And they went to King Herod and said, where is the one who is born king of the Jews? Where is the Messiah? We have seen his star rising. Whoa, this really frightened Herod and all of Jerusalem actually. And Herod didn't know, so he, he called the scribes and the chief priests, the religious authorities, the theologians, and he, he brought them in together and inquired of them where this Messiah was to be born. And they said, oh, it's written in the prophets. The child's to be born in Bethlehem, in Judea. And so Herod then brought the wise men in, and he said to them in private, he said to them quietly, he said, the child is to be born in Bethlehem of Judea. And what I want you to do is you go and see him and find him. And then you come back and tell me. So I also may go <laughs> and worship him. And so the wise men left Herod and lo and behold, there was the star. And it rose in the sky and it started moving and it moved and they followed it and it stopped right over the place where Mary and the child, the Holy Family lived. 
And they, they went in that house, and there they found Mary and Joseph and the child with them. And they brought in gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, and they, they knelt down, and they worshipped the child. They paid him homage. And they rejoiced. They were so happy at this event because it was a wondrous, amazing circumstance in their life. And they had been gifted with this time in history where they could come and worship this child. And then they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod. So they went home by another way. Well, that night, when Joseph was sleeping, he also had a dream. And the angel told him in the dream, there are those, King Herod, that are seeking this child to kill him. You need to flee to Egypt, so take the mother and the child and go. So Joseph got off immediately. He didn't wait a moment. He got up immediately, and he got Mary, and he got the child, and they fled down to Egypt, where they would be safe from King Herod. When King Herod discovered that the wise men had tricked him, had not come back and told him where the child was, but had gone home by another way, he was furious. And he was an angry, mean man. And so he ordered his soldiers to go down to Bethlehem and to kill every child that was two years of age or under. Because these are the possible ages he had gotten from the wise men about the age of this child. And there is a piece of scripture that speaks of children being killed in the Old Testament. The children died in Ramah. And they were weeping for the children, but they could not be consoled. And so this scripture speaks to this event that the mothers, and the parents, and the families of these children who died at this time could not be <coughs> consoled. And then Joseph down in Egypt had another dream. And in this dream, the angel said to him, you can arise now and go back to Israel because the ones who have sought the child's life have died. <coughs> so Joseph got up and he took his wife and he took the child and he, he went immediately up into Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus, the, the son of Herod, was now the king of Judah, he was afraid to go there and so then, being told in another dream to go up to Nazareth in Israel, he went up there. And this also fulfilled another prophecy, another scripture, that the child, the Messiah, would be a Nazarene and come from Nazareth. This is the story of the birth of Jesus of Nazareth, who came to be known following his death as the Messiah, or the Christ, who came to be known as a Savior and Lord, who is picked up in Scripture and in chant and in song, as one who was the very presence of God in our midst. And so here we are today, a group of people, year 2011, who continue to tell and to hear this story. Perhaps it touches you, this story, Perhaps it is a story that you can also share, also tell. Perhaps it's a story that can help each and every one of us live just a little bit better, try a little harder, overcoming circumstances in our life that 
cause us pain or grief, but offer gifts of joy to one another as we light up the world, as we are illuminated by the spirit of this story. So when you say happy holidays, and as you say Merry Christmas, may it be this story that is behind your thoughts and your words. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.